Welcome to our Java user group talk from tonight about application behavior exposed. I'm here with Etienne and he will talk about this wonderful topic about graphs, charts, whatever you want to visualize from the loveliest place, um, production. So I'm Patrick from the Java user group and I'm just here to tell you some administrative things and then I will be back with questions and answers as well at the end of the session. As you may know from Big Marker, we have on the right side a chat. Use it to say from where you are joining from, um, if you have technical problems, if you want to share links, whatever, use the chat for this. If you have questions, please use the Q&A part because that helps us to like separate the noise from the chat with the real questions. Then actually on the Q&A tab as well, you can upvote questions because I'm going to ask those questions to Etienne at the end of the presentation. So the higher, obviously, the earlier I will go and ask these questions. But that's it, I think that's already it. Oh no, there's there one thing actually um, I have to mention. It's about like, asking the questions directly to Etienne if you want to at the end, or just if you want to have a, a short chat. We are also doing um, the Wonder Me part networking there. Um, you get automatically redirected after the presentation, join us there so we can have a short and informal chat like as we would meet um, in reality. But then now I'm finally there, Etienne, Looking forward to your presentation. I hope you can introduce yourself a bit as well. And then I would say like, I'm turning off my cam and I would hand over to you. All right. So welcome everyone. Uh, I am uh, Etienne Dizlimetreff. I'm a software engineer at Switch uh, in the trust and identity team. And speaking of Switch, Here's a slide about it. Uh, Switch is a foundation. It began in 1987, uh, where it was uh, created by Swiss contents who had universities and they wanted to network the universities, really connect physically. Uh, and it's, this was the beginnings of the internet. And over 30 years, it expanded into a DNS. We ran the registry for .ch and .li. We have a security team doing malware analysis and lots of interesting stuff. We are a cloud provider and we run video services for e-learning and lots and lots of stuff. In my team, Trust and Identity, uh, we run the Switch EduID. This is the shared authentication and authorization infrastructure for universities. And now on to the topic of today. Has it happened to you and one of your colleagues comes over and asks, how's the application doing today? Is it running well? And then, then you turn to your monitoring system and the monitoring system is checking that the process runs and it's all green, it's there, it's fine. But if this is the only piece of information you have about your application that is running, you may be missing out on a lot of stuff. For example, you don't know if it's slow and people may complain and this is your only way you'll ever know. So today I want to give a happier ending to this story and we'll do that with observability and metrics. Uh, nowadays when we talk about observability, this means three things. You have logging, which we've been doing for a long time, uh, tracing, which is rather new, and metrics. Metrics are your numbers that you collect over time, and then you analyze this. So today, I'm going to focus on metrics. But which ones are interesting? There are many, many possible metrics. Uh, I would separate metrics into two broad categories the technical metrics and the business metrics. Well, technical metrics are, I think, pretty straightforward. You have uh, memory usage, the processor usage, the request rates, um, things that are 
quite standard and common. On the business side, I can cite a few examples of mostly common metrics like the monthly active users. That's something that uh, entertainment or game companies report. Uh, or the number of new customers or the churn rate. That means how many people cancel the subscription or leave or no longer customers. But beyond that, beyond those few examples, business metrics are highly dependent on your business domain. So it's up to you to figure out what's interesting in your particular case. Now, we've decided what we want to measure. How do we go about doing that? Um, and it will, it will very likely involve writing code for this. Uh, thankfully, there are a few initiatives that help with this. So uh, if you change your metrics, you don't have to rewrite all the code. And there are two of them that I want to mention here. There is open telemetry and micrometer. Open telemetry is a measure of open test census and open tracing, which you may have heard of. And they provide a, an interface you can write your code against to collect application metrics and also traces. And they support a lot of different languages, not only Java, but also Go, Ruby, Python, you name it. Your favorite is probably in there. Micrometer on the other side is, is purely a Java thing. It's made by Pivotal, the same company also uh, uh, publishing the Spring framework. And Micrometer uh, also provides an interface, a facade, if you will, to code against and to build metrics into your code. And this is a nice th thing about this interface. You can swap the backend that's collecting the metrics, but your code does not have to change. And that's really, really the great advantage of these two uh, pieces of, of your coding. Uh, Micrometer said they are SLF4J for metrics, and I think this is pretty accurate. It's really convenient. Now, I want to walk you through a little example here of how we can build business metrics into an application. And for this example, I'm going to use Spring Boot because it's very easy to use and it has built-in integrations with all of these things and Micrometer in particular. So in order to use Spring Boot and collect metrics, uh, you have three little things to do. The first one is adding dependencies to your project. You need the actuator starter. That's the piece uh, exposing the metrics over HTTP. And you need the Micrometer registry for Prometheus especially. Then you need to tell Spring Boot to expose the actuator endpoint. By default, it's there, but it's not, it's not enabled, it's not available. And once you configure that with a property, it will be available over HTTP so that the metrics can be collected later on. The third thing you need to do is a little bit more involved. It's a more properties to configure. And uh, here I suggest, or I want you to enable uh, histograms for one particular metric. This is the http.server.request metric. Uh, so enabling histogram uh, is important. I'll come back to this uh, in a minute. And with these four highlighted properties, you can enable histograms, set the minimum and maximum expected values. I think by default, the maximum is one minute. So if you have requests that are shorter than that, I highly recommend trimming this down so you get less, uh, less buckets uh, in the histogram. For example, 10 seconds, that's already very long. And if you have uh, specific service level objectives, SLOs, you can also configure them here. And this will have the effect uh, that, that Micrometer will set a, a boundary, a bucket boundary right at this value. So we'll know, you will know exactly how many of the requests are slower and how many are faster than that. Now, why uh, would you like a histogram? 
If you do not enable the percentile histogram uh, here, uh, you get only two values from a micrometer. This is called a summary. You get the total number of requests and the um, total time that those requests lasted. That's the whole global duration all in, in one sum. So with this, you can compute the mean. Uh, you mean your average uh, request time. But if you stick with this, you have a very, very narrow view of your latency distribution. You know only one thing, it's the, the average uh, request time. And you are blind to all the rest. And I guarantee you the rest is wild, as we see. So um, I think we did, you need better, and you need, the, uh, you need a histogram to get a better picture uh, of the latency distribution. So when you enable the histogram, you can then compute percentiles with this. Um, the two most interesting ones, in my opinion, are P95 and a P99. That means that 99% of the requests are uh, at this value or faster. And this gives you a much better idea of how your application is performing, how fast are the, the requests are served, and in comparison to the mean, or even the median if you even on the compute P50. Uh, one interesting metric you can also look at and you'll get is the maximum request. Can be, it's not interesting in all cases, but it can be sometimes interesting to look at to see that you have very, very long requests, but P95 or P99, the, the better ones. And here's example data out of uh, one of the applications that we run. So this is real data, and you can see um, the distribution is nothing standard. It's not a Gaussian distribution. It's not a Poisson distribution. It's completely wild all over the place. The first, um, the first bucket, the leftmost bucket, is actually uh, through the roof with one more than one million requests in it. So it goes way way above the graph. And just to show you on a different view with a log rate log scale, so we can see all of the small requests, a small amount of requests, yeah. It's really nothing like a, a Gaussian distribution. So don't don't expect it to be a nice bell curve. Now, after we've enabled um, the metrics in Spring Boot, you get crap ton of things by default. So you get JVM metrics, you got process metrics, you got how many log lines have been written. Uh, if you get, if you have HTTP servers or clients in your code, you get timing, re request timings about this. And if you use databases or caches, you also get metrics about all of this. So just by enabling Micrometer in Spring Boot, tons and tons of uh, technical metrics. But we wanted business metrics, remember? That's the interesting stuff. So to write your code with business metrics, Micrometer gives you three tools. You have counters, gauges, and timers. Counters are basically it. You can increment uh, counters. They sometimes reset, but that's all, just to count events. Gauges are for value that go up or down, like the size of a collection or the size of a queue. And timers um, are for measuring how long things take. Uh, for example, uh, the, with at time annotation here on the method, uh, you'll have to enable something else for this world. It doesn't work out of the box, but the at time annotation will report how long this method call uh, took. Otherwise, you can also start and stop timers manually if you want. Now, we have metrics enabled built in in our app. What are we going to do with them? Well, we're going to collect those metrics, of course. And for this, we need to organize them a bit. And up to now in monitoring systems, the way metrics have been organized uh, was a hierarchical. So um, you, want, you, you get a biz metric name 
And all the rest, all the information has to be encoded somehow. Here we have shapes. Uh, we have, have orange shapes, blue shapes, squares, discs, triangles. All of this information must fit into the metric name because in your hierarchical system, that's all you have. Um, and that makes it that makes it actually quite difficult to aggregate metrics. Uh, in this example, you can probably aggregate on the first piece. So this, you can count all the squares and all the disks, regardless of the color. Uh, but if you want to aggregate on any other, you want all the orange ones, it's probably going to be very difficult, if not impossible, in that kind of system. So that's that's why nowadays we have a different breed of system, the dimensional system, where uh, the shape and the color information, all of that is encoded um, in a tag or a label or a dim these are the dimensions. That's common names of that thing, uh, tag, label, or dimension. And this is nothing else than a name value pair attached to your metric. So you can add as many dimensions as you want uh, in your system and the order does not matter. And in a dimensional system, you can very, very easily aggregate across any dimension. So you want to sum by color, no problem. So we need such a dimensional system and the one I'm going to use this example is Prometheus. Prometheus, that's a time series database. It pulls data over HTTP from your application. Uh, it started actually in 2012 at SoundCloud and has become quite popular uh, since then. So we need now we need to run Prometheus. How do you go about running Prometheus? Well, use the Docker image, of course, that's quite easy. And in this case, the Docker image is pretty good. I'm, I'm usually picky about the Docker image I, I use, but this one I can tell you it's, it's okay. So you need a little bit of configuration for Prometheus. You need to tell it where your application is and the, the path, if you can also run this over HTTPS, protect it with a password, all of this is there. Um, okay, now we have, we have Prometheus collecting the metrics from our application. And, and one day suddenly, your Prometheus is getting slow. Your queries take a lot of time to, to provide a reply. And you notice that Prometheus is eating all the memory on the VM it's running on. So what's going on here? Well, you are the victim of a cardinality explosion. Cardinality here is used in, in the mathematical sense of the word. It's simply the number of possible values for any dimension. So what happens in, inside Prometheus is it stores one time series per combination of all the dimensions. So if you have one dimension that has a lot of possible values like thousands or even hundreds, then you will get a lot of time series in the primitive storage. Uh, examples are a random session identifier or usernames. If you have these in dimension, you are setting yourself up for a cardinality explosion. And this is what happened to me. I had the HTTP request path in there and I thought I was smart because I limited this to five components. Um, but um, the J session ID snuck in there, a random identifier. It's not separated by a slash, so it's the fifth component. And I had a ton of crap metrics I had to delete because my Prometheus was very, very slow after that. Hey. So if you want to do something with high cardinality dimensions, my advice would be to put this into your logs. This is a much better place than your monitoring system for high cardinality data. Cool, now we have all this data collected. There is one thing left to do. And this one thing is getting the data out there, displaying it. Because remember your colleague from the beginning of the talk asking how's the application doing today? Well, you don't want to be 
answering that question every day, do you? I certainly do not want to. So grab the largest screen you can get your hands on and put your data up there. Of course, if you can afford this one, go ahead and do it. Uh, I have a cheaper alternative though. If you have a uh, old unused monitor or an unused laptop uh, around the office, this will do as long as you put this into the, the office. And why, why would you um, display the data for anyone to see, at least your colleagues inside your company? Um, because, because dashboards are, are powerful. And um, I want to illustrate this with a story to show you that dashboards have an effect, actually an effect on people. So this happened to me uh, while I was working in a small company a few years ago. And um, I was in charge of, uh, of improving the software development process. So I installed Jenkins and configured Jenkins to uh, build all the projects we had under version control. And um, then I noticed there was a TV screen lying around the office and then I asked the secretary, hey, this, this, does anyone use it? Can, can I have it? And she says, yes, okay. Uh, so I grabbed this TV screen, an old laptop, set up a browser to display a dashboard for Jenkins. And as you can see, not everything is green. There are a couple of red projects. And then I just left it there for everybody to see and did nothing more. So, and about a month, month later, it was like this, all green, just as I was about to fly home for the Christmas holidays. And uh, yeah, as, as I said, I did nothing special. I just left it there. And then what happened? What happened is that other developers came up to me and asked me, Etienne, what, what, why is my project right there on this screen? And then that was my chance to tell them, oh, you know, there's this Jenkins thing. It tries to compile your code and run your test. So if you don't have a build command or if your test fail, it's going to be red, you know? And to explain them, yeah, what was going on? And then they went ahead and fixed it. I did not go ahead and fix the code. They fixed it themselves. So that's the effect dashboards can have on people. That's the one I have in the office or used to have before the pandemic. And it, it shows me the request rate for uh, for an API. Uh, the middle graph actually is the errors. So if I, I walk in and look at that, and if it's anything in the middle, I know there's something wrong. And anybody walking past in the office can also see that and wonder how do they get these cool dashboards? This looks really nice. Well, you get it with Grafana. Grafana is an open source visualization program. It, you can plug it in into any, pretty much any data source you want. Prometheus, of course, your database, InfluxDB, Graphite, Elasticsearch, uh, you name it. It was first released in 2014, so a couple of years after uh, Prometheus. And uh, the funny story is was at the time, um, Prometheus had a dashboarding function. So Prometheus could also draw a nice dashboard on, on the web. And then the, the, the Prometheus developers saw what Grafana did and say, oh, well, this is so good. We don't need to maintain our dashboard function anymore. Let's remove this and tell people to use Grafana. So there you have it, Grafana. And to make it faster, well, use the Docker image again. I, there is a little bit of configuration to do. Just give Grafana the URL of your Prometheus instance. And to speed things up a bit more, then use one of the pre-made community dashboards for Spring Boot. I have two examples of these. I'm using one of them. And when you activate that, then you get a lot of technical metrics. JVM metrics, process, memory, everything. There is even stuff at the bottom that I do not understand. So that's a few screens full of 
information. And um, if you're not a Java developer, or if you don't know the how the JVM works, you might feel like you're in this aircraft cockpit. Uh, so is, is anyone qualified to fly the Boeing 737-NG in the audience? Well, for the rest of us, this is way too much information and you're lost into this information overload. So be careful, you can totally go overboard with Grafana and display too many things. So my advice here is to split your dashboard into three categories. First, you have your business metrics. This is the most important dashboard. And you put a couple business metrics there. Not too much, it has to fit on one screen. If you need to scroll, this is too much. Then you have your technical dashboards with the most important technical metrics for your application. And then you take all the rest and you hide it into your troubleshooting dashboard. This is the place where you go and have a look only when you are troubleshooting something, not every day, and it's not on the big screen. And this will allow you, when you have this business metrics, just you, you, can, you can start very simple, just two, three metrics on a dashboard. This is enough to start. And I guarantee you, when you have this in your office, this will trigger conversations. Oh yeah, people will walk by and wonder if it's fellow developers, you can tell them all about how you had, you build the school dashboards. And then they will also go and do it for their application. If it's business people, do not let them go. Ask them what are the most important metrics for the application and then you can add those. So you see, you have the small dashboard, triggers conversation, then you can expand it to more and more business metrics. Because having having metrics, having dashboards like this, they really make everybody happy. You've got something for business people, you've got something for operations people, and you've got stuff for developers. Probably a bit too much, but lots and lots of stuff. And this, this can inform all these groups of people to better operate the, op the application or better plan the features, for example. One uh, real life example of how we used uh, those metrics is for uh, for switch EduID. We operate a piece of open source software, uh, which is the Shibboleth Identity Provider. That's the, the login page. And uh, with this HTTP request rate, uh, request uh, time, then we can know easily, is it fast enough? Does it fulfill our requirements for availability or response time and so on? And if they are, if anything is above the red line, then it's too slow. Same piece of software on the business side. Um, you can see three colors on the graph. There's a green, there's a yellow, and the blue. And they correspond to three things you can do with this application. Um, well, the, the light blue is, is hidden at the bottom, and that's the logout. So what the data here is telling us is there's no point improving or putting work into the logout function. There's very few people using it. So we can make it leave it like this. It's fine. So to summarize, adding your code is easier than ever with Micrometer, adding your metrics to the code. And then you can easily also operate Prometheus and Grafana to collect metrics and display them, uh, have nice, really nice dashboards, and then Trigger conversations with the colleagues, expanding more metrics. Don't forget to remove the old ones that are not used anymore. And everybody will be happy now. That was it. Thank you for your attention. Patrick, I think we can turn to the chat for questions or any, are there any burning questions? Thanks, Etienne. As you just mentioned, please um, write your questions in the Q&A part, and I will go and read them for Etienne. Um, meanwhile, we are waiting for the questions 
Um, I have a question to you. So you were saying that like for the developers or for business, the dashboards are not that big. But what if you have the troubleshooting dashboard? Is it not like lots of overhead you're, you're having in your system when you're collecting so many data and then you're not using it? It can be. Yes, yes, it, it totally can be. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wonder also if I, if I would need to prune this for my primitive instance. <laughs> um, yeah, if you have, well, Prometheus is, is designed to collect really a lot of metrics. It's not, um, it's not a, it's a serious piece of software. And uh, so it can handle much, much data. Um, but yeah, if, if you're collecting things, then in the end, you never use them. I would remove those. I, I'm, I'm not actually only thinking of actually Prometheus and like what the service does, because I know it is also, it's built like to be very um, efficient and it's using, it's using a crawling mechanism. So it's like pulling the application, but what would worry me would be like my Spring Boot app has to provide lots of metrics and then you just, it's garbage, you know, you don't use it at all. So you have actually in the Java application, you have like um, additional monitoring threats metrics produced and so on where you have like way more load in the application um itself than actually mm. the other in this end um yes i, I think it could be an issue this is why I, I for the histograms histograms in macrometer typically uh use more memory than just a summary so that's why i would not enable histograms of every every metric every timer so the first question actually came already in and they are asking, do you have an example project somewhere on Git, GitHub? Uh, myself, unfortunately, no. Um, I don't remember if Micrometer has, probably either at Micrometer or, or at Spring Boot. I also don't know a place yet. Probably just search on GitHub for one and you will find some for sure. Yeah. Um, Alexandre is asking, can you say some words on the maintenance and life cycle of Grafana dashboards? It's a very good question. Yeah, this is an interesting one <laughs> because I, I think I'm running into that kind of issue now. Um, um, up to now, uh, we've been configuring the dashboards by, by clicking into uh, Grafana's UI. And um, this works as long as you have only one instance. Uh, but if you set up your monitoring stack to have one, one uh, stack per that data center, for example, then you would have one Prometheus server and probably one Grafana as well per data center, then you need to synchronize, have the same configuration. So um, yeah, synchronizing. I know Grafana uses a database, so you can probably connect it to the same database mm -hmm. to get the same configuration. Um, and then the life cycle um, of dashboards especially, yeah, they, they evolve. Uh, we've had, I've, I've removed graphs that I don't find useful in the end. Uh, graphs that are on, on on the big screen, and you 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 can also yeah you evolve the queries, make better queries. You oh, you need to learn the primitive query language a bit uh, for this. And the lifecycle of Grafana itself, if you use it with Docker, then uh, it's fairly easy to upgrade. Great. Um... Andre is asking another question. He asks um, if you have any hints about the impact of telemetry um, regarding like spring response time, load, latency, and so on. Um, on my applications, unfortunately, I don't know uh, if this is a, using too much resources or not. It's not a problem um, today. Uh, we're not overloading the applications we're monitoring with this. Um, but I don't, I don't have a number to say, yeah, it's going, it's using 1%, for example, uh, of the, of the road. I, I think I saw an explanation of this. Um, 
in the micrometer documentation because this is this is totally a legitimate concern to have. That's true. Yeah, because because you add additional infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, I have another question, and this would be like also regarding the life cycle and the maintenance of the of the dashboards. When you think of that, and um, business people see something, can you tell us maybe a story about that, like how these dashboards then evolve, or like like in in your experience when you show like um, the the response time for the login that they say, ah, actually I can actually see something else which could be interesting and. Let's visualize it, like for example, devices or something like browsers or or so, like how it's used, which application use it, and so on. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Maybe in your yeah. case, since since you have multiple universities, you could also say like well, some universities are using it more often than the others, so we can charge them more, something like this. It could be. I think we we do export uh, privately for the universities. Um, the number of of logins for for their users on Switch ID and which services are, are the most the most popular services. Uh, I know we, we do export this, but uh, this is private. <laughs> um, but it, it's interesting interesting because um, uh, in a, in another discussion, Patrick, you mentioned that that GitLab publishes their metrics. They have like an open Grafana instance. So I think it was, this is also a cool idea to just publish your metrics if there's uh, nothing too much secret in there. Um, an example of of conversation that happened with the Jenkins dashboard, the, the red and green projects, is uh, one day the CEO saw this and he walked up to me and, said, and asked, Etienne, if it's red, should I worry? I think this this was a wonderful question. Okay. Yeah. How, how important is it, and will it automatically be fixed or not? Right. Some has somebody to, to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, Thomas is asking, um, do you have any experience to run such a setup within Kubernetes and or with multiple Spring Boot services? Possible pitfalls? Um. Not with Kubernetes directly because I don't use it. Um, as I said, Prometheus can collect metrics from hundreds or thousands of targets. That's, that's not a problem for this this software. Um, and if you use some Kubernetes distributions, I know like OpenShift, they do bundle Prometheus and Grafana in there. So whenever you launch a service on this platform, then you will have metrics automatically, at least the technical ones. Um, pitfalls, well, as collecting too many, too much data, too many numbers that you don't use, it can be a pitfall. But I have yet to uh, to overload my primitives with data that I don't use. Usually it's, it's the cardinality explosion that happens. <laughs> Yeah, Mark is writing into the chat a very nice statement because he says, I don't like the way business code is polluted with metric code like counter increase, but that's the trade off. Um, yeah, good comment. It, it, it does have influence on the code, yeah. Um, well, I so think it depends. It is you, like logging. I mean, if you do you do audit logging in your application, you have this kind of, of pollution already. I think you showed like this Spring AOP approach where you use like um, aspects, like that time denotation, which mm -hmm. would be wrapped around the method. So you don't have to have access to this. But as soon as you go very deep into the business part where you have a, a gauche or a counter or so, I think, yes, then sometimes it's not possible to do it in a different way. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. if you use the micrometer interface or the open tracing interface, uh, it won't pollute your code as much as if you were using the Prometheus registry directly or the the, 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 the libraries in Java for Prometheus. Uh, and yeah, as you said, with aspect-oriented programming, you can probably get around it and avoid it a little bit. There was no mention of JMX. Um, Andre or Alexandre is stating is 
is it still what's under the hood to access the metrics? Or do you have any insights on this? Um, I don't use JMX. The, the interface for Prometheus is HTTP. That's what it expects for uh, going in and fetching the metrics. Um, there are, there are um, backends that can export metrics over JMX. Probably not so sure. Drop Wizard or other other backends you can use uh, with Micrometer. Not the Prometheus one. Prometheus is only HTTP. Or on the other way around, if you already have metrics into an application and they, these are available over JMX, uh, what you can do is use uh, the JMX exporter for Prometheus. I think this this is a thing that exists. <laughs> and what we will do is uh, read the metrics over JMX, expose them over, uh, over HTTP for Prometheus. So this would be a way to, to bridge uh, those two systems. Cool. So let's wait like one more minute for more questions. Um, or otherwise, we could say, let's continue the talk um, in WonderMe. I mean, or let's continue the Q&A part in WonderMe. So last chance um, to answer questions or put questions in the Q&A. I will just like go through my last slides and want to let you know that we are sending out emails um, where you will get a link to provide feedback. And we are really looking forward to those feedbacks. And as you know, like every month we are like doing a draw and we give away one license of IntelliJ, Ultimate Edition, obviously. We have some great talks again, like within the next weeks. So um, Bert Jan Schriever from Open Value is talking about debugging distributed systems. There will be in Zurich even a event on site. So Gernot Stake will talk about the art of software reviews. And this is really like, um, in a location on the 28th of September, we just like reserved the place. And then we will have another session about making mistakes and trade-offs when optimizing the hot path. And um, as you can see, we are having some great events coming on and we are trying to get into this mix mode again, right? As you know, um, our talks are on YouTube. So um, Dimitri's uh, sorry, not Dimitri, ATN's talk will be hopefully live on Sunday, 10 o'clock in the morning. So if you have missed uh, the first part or maybe the last part, then actually, or even if you have missed other talks, subscribe to YouTube and you will get informed. And obviously we also have um, a Slack community. And if you would exchange with others, get some insights or some pings from us, um, go to our Slack community and register there and you will get notified or you can contribute and exchange. The last thing I wanna do is um, I want to say thank you to Etienne. So my thank you will actually arrive via post. So you will get one of these like famous um, Swiss army knives from the Java user group. Hey, and cool, every, nice. Every speaker <laughs> will get it. So um, if one of the participants has also like the wish to get one of those, you just have to do a talk and then you will get one. And then obviously we have to say thank you to our sponsors, which make the whole format possible. And also the staff behind the scenes, Ursula and Marcos. Yes. And now we are just like heading over to Wonder Me. So you are redirected automatically and we can exchange there, have a short chat and yeah, just like finish this whole setup in a networking environment. So let's say, see you there in one, two minutes. And um, yeah, bye-bye.